right. So this is a continuation of chapter 32. And what we're going to be doing in this video is looking at some examples of the new imperialism. Now, we call this period or this process new imperialism, which is different from the old imperialism. The difference is really easy. This is simply the imperialism of the 19th century. So this is your industrialized imperialism. The old imperialism is the imperialism of the 16th and 17th and 18th century. So if we think about the Spanish conquest of the Americas, the British conquest of North America, uh, you know, the 13th colonies, all of that stuff, that's the old imperialism. So these are some examples of the new imperialism. This is the stuff that we looked at in the last video. So we're going to look at a few examples of this today, uh, starting with maybe the most important example of the new imperialism, which is in India. Now, remember, we're thinking about this from the point of view of the colonizers. So we're going to be looking at this process in India from the British perspective. So India becomes a British colony. This process gets started way back in 1608. So in 1608, the Mughals allow the British East India Company, British East India Company, to set up a trading post. Innocent enough. The Mughals allowed the British East India Company to set up a trading post. And I'm going to abbreviate this, the BEIC, because that is a lot to write. So the BEIC, the British East India Company. Over the next hundred years, by 1707, the Mughals had declined. The last really important Mughal emperor, Aurangzeb, had died. Aurangzeb died, and the Mughal Empire started to decline. Under poor leadership. And that allowed the British East India Company to take over. The British East India Company began to exert more and more control over India. Think of this as if Apple were to take over the government of California. It's, the, it's pretty much the same thing. By 1757, so 50 years after this, the British East India Company defeated the Mughal Empire and took over India. Again, this would be as if Apple were to take over the government of the United States. So, keep in mind, this is not the British government. This is the British East India Company in control of India. 
So we get a period of time called company rule. Company rule. The British East India Company is now pretty much the government of India. And they do all the stuff that you would expect a government to do. They train soldiers and bureaucrats. They collect taxes, they sign treaties, but this is the British East India Company doing it. Now, the last thing we need to know about this, at least for the time being, is that these Indian soldiers trained by the British East India Company were called sepoys. So these are Indians, but they're trained by the British, and they are called sepoys. The reason I bring them up is because about a hundred years after this, they are going to rebel. In 1857, we get what's called the sepoy rebellion, or sometimes called the Sepoy Mutiny. And here's what happened. The Sepoys uh, heard a rumor. There was a rumor that the bullets in their fancy new guns were lubricated with animal fat. So far, it doesn't seem like there's any problem with that, except when we think about the religions of India, the two really important religions of India at this point are Hinduism and Islam. The two animals from which the fat came from were pigs, which are forbidden in Islam, and cows, which are forbidden in Hinduism. Now, it's one thing to touch the fat of these animals, but the way that they would get the bullets out of these uh, like self-contained little envelopes that the bullets were housed in is you had to rip them open with your teeth. And if you rip them open with your teeth, you'd have to maybe possibly ingest some of this pig or cow fat. And this caused a rebellion. So the sepoys rebelled because of this. Now, keep in mind, this is just a rumor. I don't even know if it's true or not, but it doesn't have to be true because they believed it. So the sepoys rebelled because of the supposed animal fat on their bullets. And the British government, not the British East India Company, but the British government now came in and squashed the rebellion. And then the British government took over India. And that was the end of the British East India Company. So that was the end of the British East India Company, the Sepoy Rebellion. So in this example, we're seeing a lot of the stuff we brought up in the last video. Here is another example. So Japan. Now, if you remember back to before break, when we talked about what was going on in China, 
The British came into China, they threatened to blow up the Grand Canal, the Chinese surrendered, and the Chinese signed these unequal treaties with the British. We're going to see pretty much the same thing happen to Japan. So we're going to see the same thing happen to Japan. So this is very similar to what happened in China with the British. So here are our differences. We're going to swap out the Americans for the British and we're going to subtract the opium. So the Americans are doing this and they're just doing it with blunt force. They're not going to try to give them drugs. So this process happens in 1853. So in 1853, the Americans show up in Japan. They threaten to blow up the capital unless Japan starts to trade. Unless the Japanese start to trade with the Americans. And the Japanese surrender. The Japanese say, we are in no position to fight against the Americans. So the Japanese surrender and sign their own unequal treaty with the United States. But unlike the Chinese, the Japanese are going to look at this as a wake-up call. They are going to rapidly change their position. So, starting in 1868, we get this rapid turnaround called the Meiji Restoration. The Meiji Restoration is called a restoration because the Emperor of Japan is restored to actual power. He was always around, but he didn't really have any power. So what the Meiji Restoration does is it restores the Emperor to actually being in charge. But for us, the Meiji Restoration is the start of a rapid industrialization process. So, we'll talk more about this in our next video, but in 1905, Japan defeats Russia in a war. Before this, before the Meiji Restoration, Japan was backwards. They had no industrialization. They could not fight anybody. A short, what is that, 40 years later, they're defeating another European power in a war. This is a crazy amount of change over 40 years. We'll talk more about this war in the next video. But suffice to say, Japan looks at what happened to China and they say, no, 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 we don't want any part of that. We've got to get our act together. And they start rapidly industrializing to the point where they defeat another industrialized power in a war. All right. The last place that we want to take a look at in this video is the United States. The good old U.S. of A.
So the last time we talked about the United States, they had used their manifest destiny to take over uh, kind of the middle part of North America. And in doing so, defeated and took over the Native American people of North America. So we've already talked about that part, but now we're going to keep going. Because once the United States got to the Pacific Ocean, they wanted to keep going. They needed more land to take over. And they took little pieces of land here and there. Like they took over the islands of Hawaii in the 1890s. Which is a really interesting story if you want to look into it. Basically a bunch of pineapple magnates took over the islands and then gave them to the United States. But that's small potatoes. What the Americans really want is an empire of their own. And unfortunately, most of the territory around the world has been taken over by other imperial powers. So if they want an empire of their own, they're going to have to take an empire from someone else. And there is an aging, decrepit empire that they can take advantage of. And they're going to start a war. With Spain. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. So Spain, which once controlled about half of the planet, is now going to go to war with the United States and get their butts kicked. So the United States starts this war with Spain in 1898. You don't need to worry about why the war starts. But essentially, the war ends with a total American victory. You get a total American victory, and the United States gets a bunch of old Spanish territory. The United States gets the island of Guam. The United States gets the island of Puerto Rico. And they also get the islands of the Philippines. I think I spelled that one right. So all of this stuff now gets to be part of a growing American empire. Uh, we're going to stop there. So in our next video, we're going to look at some of the big effects of this new imperialism. So in our next video, we're going to take a look at what's going on in Africa, because that's a big deal. Uh, we're going to look at what's going on with Germany and Italy, because there's a lot of nationalism at play at this, as we talked about in our last video. Uh, and we're going to see how this leads us down the road to World War One. So keep your eyes 